I was also just horrified that I had been giving people bad advice and treating people in the wrong way for 17 bloody years. And it feels awful. Felt like, And it's much easier to stick your head in the sand and say, these people are quacks. It's not real, but let me, it is, it is. I've seen it over and over again. I've, you know, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients. They adopt this, they get amazingly better. Almost all of them is that folks that have type two diabetes don't die from their diabetes. They die from heart disease. They die from kidney failure. They die from cancer. And if you think about the diet that they're eating, this very low carb, but high in fat, which is usually high in cholesterol and saturated fat. So you're clogging up your arteries and it's very high in protein um, because you got to make up for those calories that you would be getting in your carbs, right? And the high in protein is hurting your kidneys and all of that stimulating cancer growth. So basically the same diet that reverses diabetes is healthy enough to reverse heart disease. It minimizes your risk of cancer as much lower risk of incidence of cancer or, or recurrence of cancer. Um, and it's great for your kidneys. So it's welcome to the Crisco and company podcast. I'm your host, Lee Crisco MD. Today, our guest is Carrie Graff MD, who is certified in both family medicine and lifestyle medicine. And in fact, she was one of the first 204 physicians in the world to become certified in lifestyle medicine in 2017. She's practiced primary care in upstate New York for 26 years, but now dedicates 100% of her time practicing lifestyle medicine with Love Life Telehealth. She dedicated the first half of her career to treating patients with pills and procedures, and now has devoted the second half of her career helping patients reverse chronic disease with lifestyle changes instead. Welcome, Dr. Graf. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to be here. Um, now, tell us, how did you stumble into lifestyle medicine after practicing conventional medicine for so many years? Yeah, I got sick. I mean, I think it's the way a lot of us end up on it, like, because we don't learn any about anything about it in medical school or in residency. And it, you just don't know how much of a difference it makes. Um, and uh, well, I'd actually had heard about the health benefits of a vegan diet, it wasn't called whole food back then, in 1997. And actually, that was the first year that I um, had finished residency and I started into practice. I was here in Canada, New York at Thompson Hospital. And I, um, that was back in the day when you had to round on your own patients, right? And when you wanted to know what the x-ray results were from that morning, you had to go down to the radiology department and look at the film with one of the radiologists because, you know, nothing was quick and, and nothing was digital. So, um, so I went down to, uh, to find out the results of my patient's chest x-ray that morning. And I went into um, Dr. Ted Barnett's office. Uh, he was the head of radiology down there. So, you know, Ted. Um, and, uh, and he, um, well, he had a lot of bird things around his office too, but he had all these things with vegetables. And I was like, what the heck is going on in this room? And um, so he kind of like regaled me with the wonders of, of, of vegan diets for health. And I'm like, you know, I never heard anything about any of this in med school or residency. And so I'm like, you're a really nice guy. And I appreciate your help with my chest x-ray. But, um, you know, I just kind of wrote him off as an animal rights nut job and didn't take him seriously. And, uh, you know, karma comes back to bite you in the butt because over the next 17 years, I got all kinds of medical problems. I gained a fair bit of weight and I had reflux and depression and hypothyroidism and endometriosis and infertility. And I don't even know what else, uh, prediabetes. And, um, and, uh, then I was at a point, um, about 11 years ago, my kids were kind of preteens, early teenage then. And, uh, they had guilted me into getting Netflix cause I would be the loser mother if I did not. And um, I had checked my blood sugar after eating some Chinese food that night, and it was 197. It might have been 198. I can't remember. It was either 197 or 198. And I was like, holy heck, I didn't even eat as much as I normally would have. So I was like, this is bad. And I ended up watching uh, Forks Over Knives, which was on Netflix back in the day. It's now not on Netflix for anybody who's looking for it. Just go to the Forks Over Knives website, and you can actually watch it for free at, if you scroll to the bottom of their website. Um, and so I watched that movie and I was like, well, heck, they're, they're either all on to something and I just missed the memo because I, I didn't put out a memo when I was in med school or they're all, you know, crazy like Ted Barnett. And then I kind of just set out to find out what was, you know, what, it, what was true and what wasn't. And I spent a number of months kind of on a deep dive looking at all of the data um, that they were claiming in the movie. And I did an N of one, you know, study of one. I put myself on a whole food plant-based low fat diet to see what would happen and I got so miraculously better over the next three months, it was jaw dropping, right? So, um, 
depression for 20 years was gone. Um, I was over time, I was able to we wean off my thyroid medication, but constipation was gone. My reflux was gone. My prediabetes resolved the very first day that I started on the diet. I didn't have any abnormal sugars after that when they were hardly ever normal prior to that when I was checking. Um, and I was just so incredibly much better. I lost 25 pounds without being hungry. And I kind of joke that I started talking about, uh, my, my patients kind of noticed that I looked and felt a lot better and they asked me what I was doing. And I, I joke that I started talking about plant-based diets and just never shut up. And um, it was actually not too far from the truth. Although now I include other pieces and not just the diet part. Um, so that's how I started incorporating it into my, into my primary care practice, how I stumbled on it myself as well. And, and then it just, I had a solo practice at that time. And so you didn't have to get anybody's permission to do anything. And I could take long appointments. And so I just did what I wanted, which was a lot of counseling and and then, um, then I realized that the group and co component was really important. Um, and so, and some people need a more structured system for walking them through how to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. So I developed a class and then an ongoing support group and just kind of put all these things into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people that, you know, stumble into this plant-based thing, there's some big event that just shifts their perspective. Um, it was kind of the same for me. I, um, I, I read, heard Dr. Greger talking and, uh, you know, read his book, his How Not to Die book. And I was, I was blown away. Like, you know, I'd been an MD for years and it's like, how did, where was the memo on this? We paid a lot of money for that degree. Why did they not teach yeah. us like this really important stuff? I was ticked yeah. off. Yeah. And then, and then I read Dr. Uh, McDougall's, you know, the starch solution and he was advocating, you know, the this high carb thing. And I was pre-diabetic myself. And I was really skeptical, but I said, I'm going to suspend my disbelief. And I just said, I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to try this for about a week to see what happens. And I ate nothing but, you know, uh, potatoes and rice and corn and beans and fruit for a week. And I was thinking my blood sugar is going to skyrocket. Oh, my yeah. weight's going to go up. Uh, and literally within about three days, my blood sugar completely normalized. I mean, not just normalized, but it was optimal. It was at the bottom of the normal range, you know, 65 first thing in the morning, wasn't feeling, feeling hungry. And, uh, you know, I lost some weight, got leaner, improved exercise tolerance. I mean, my viewers have heard this story before, but, um, and then, and then you realize, you know, I, I, I'm a diagnostic radiologist and uh, you realize that what you're doing is you're spending your day diagnosing lifestyle diseases. And that fact had been in, fr in front of me the whole time for decades and I wasn't aware of it. Right and, over your head, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's why, um, uh, you know, I did a couple talks on it and um, uh, I was thinking of just doing some, you know, low production YouTube things. And I did one for the people that I work with <clears throat> and it got, you know, 70 people view viewed it. It was really just for the people that I worked with. And then uh, anyways, I met Joyce and I was saying, I want to continue to do some videos like that, you know, get a few people to watch. She said, no, 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 let's really dive into this. So, so that's what we've done. And uh, you know, she had some health improvements. And so it's really kind of like this come to Jesus thing where you sort of see the truth that, and it's, I mean, I'm sure you've had the same experience. You go to work in the conventional healthcare system and like nobody knows about this or very few people do. And, and there's a lot of resistance to it too. Yeah. But I totally get that because, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to being really ticked off that I spent all that money, they didn't teach me the most important things I needed to know. I was also just horrified that I had been giving people bad advice and treating people in mm -hmm. the wrong way for 17 bloody years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it feels awful. Like mm -hmm. when you, it, it's not this aha, oh my God, I get it now. It's this great moment. For me, it wasn't anyway. And maybe it's different when you're in radiology, when you're not the one who's actually giving the patient the advice. So it's not like this mm -hmm. gut wrenching, horrible mm -hmm. feeling like, oh, I've been throwing pills at people and I should have been telling them something else because you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at their films, but um, it was awful. And so I, I understand when there's a lot of resistance, both from the, I, I wasn't willing to accept it because I figured they would have taught it to me in med school. It took me a long time. And then how horrible that felt. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to stick your head in the sand and say, these people are quacks. It's mm -hmm. not real, but let me, it is, it is. I've seen it over and over again. I've, you know, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients. They adopt this. They get amazingly better. Almost all mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually started out as a family doctor years ago and I practiced for three years as primary care doctor. 
And uh, one of the reasons I left family medicine, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons I left it was I was frustrated because one of the things that motivated, motivated me to be a primary care doctor was to help people be healthy. And I felt like a, like a failure in that regard. Um, so I thought I would concentrate more on the diagnostic side of, of medicine. But I, what I realized now is that I didn't really have the tools. Like, you know, this information wasn't really quite out there to the level it is now. And I wasn't as aware of it. I really well, wasn't aware of it. Yeah, even when you have the knowledge now, if you're working in a health system that's forcing you to see four patients an hour, yeah, you're getting nowhere, right? Because you don't, yeah. you barely have time to do the stuff you absolutely, you don't even have time to do the stuff you have to do, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's impossible. So it becomes really, it becomes really, really hard, even if you, even if you know it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The hospital systems yeah. don't want to support it because they're almost all of them are all fee for service still, and they they don't make money if the patient's healthy. If you take twice as long with them, they lose yep. money twice. The patient's not going to come back because they're healthier, and they lost all the money for the time you spent with them. Yes, unfortunately, the incentives are all wrong in the current healthcare system. Um, just the other day, uh, uh, Joyce and I started going to this little church and. After church, you know, people sit down, they have coffee and whatnot. And uh, the conversation was about like which snack to choose. And this older lady was saying, well, you know, I pick, I'm picking the cheese and the crackers because of my blood sugar. And, you know, um, and uh, there was another elderly fellow talking about his diabetes. And I said, well, you know, I used to be pre-diabetic myself and you won't believe how I cured it is I went on a high carbohydrate diet. And of course, there's this just look of utter incredulity. I, you know, I don't know if she knew I was a doctor or not. I don't think she did, but uh, it's just com like just complete incredulity. Yeah. Um, and you know, you're right. I know I'm right, but it's hard to penetrate that that brainwashing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested to know how do you get through to people about how to do this when they're bombarded there's all this stuff out there now about eating a carnivore diet and the keto diet and paleo diet and uh, that's how people think that they're supposed to manage their diabetes and stay lean H how do you penetrate that 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 disbelief when you're dealing with people yeah yeah so it, it helps if you're in primary care and they've got a long-standing relationship with you right so that that definitely was to my advantage um and lots of times people aren't ready to make that change, but you know, you can kind of say, look, we've, we now have a better understanding of diabetes. The real underlying issue is insulin resistance. And that has to do with fat. It's both the fat in your bloodstream from the meal you just ate. And it's the fat that's sitting in your muscle cell and it's making the insulin not be able to get in. And that's making your sugar be all stuck in your bloodstream and make your sugars high. And you know, one of the other things that almost everybody can relate to is like, that means the sugar stuck outside your muscle cell. And that's why you feel like, tired all the time when you've got diabetes, right? You're, you're really fatigued and like you're kind of underpowered. You're trying to, you know, to run, run your car on a two cylinder engine. You just don't have any oomph. And like everybody can say, oh yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Like I'm really underpowered. And then you're also always hungry because your muscles are like, oh my God, I don't have sugar. You better feed me. So if you can give them something that they can relate to and they'll be like, hmm, okay. And then you can say, well, look, they actually, I know it sounds crazy, but they did a head to head between a low fat whole food plant-based diet and the ADA diet, and even excluding everybody whose medication they had to reduce because or or stop because it was you know too dangerous, which was most of them. Just looking at the folks that didn't have those really strong good reactions, it was still three times better. And I'm like, really? And you're like, yeah, we just had it wrong. And then you also, um, you know, one of the things that we that I talk about with folks is if they're diabetic anyway, is that um, is that folks that have type two diabetes don't die from their diabetes. They die from heart disease, they die from kidney failure, they die from cancer. And if you think about the diet that they're eating, this very low carb, but high in fat, which is usually high in cholesterol and saturated fat. So you're clogging up your arteries and it's very high in protein um, because you gotta make up for those calories that you would be getting in your carbs, right? And the high in protein is hurting your kidneys and all of that stimulating cancer growth. So basically the same diet that reverses diabetes is healthy enough to reverse heart disease it minimizes your risk of cancer as much lower risk of incidence of cancer or or recurrence of cancer um and it's great for your kidneys so it's like and then people are kind of like hmm, okay and then you give them time like you know usually i'll be like why don't you check it out for yourself yeah um, yeah so we... that, that approach is usually gentle right because i i nobody if, if you make a change because you're scared 
that's mm -hmm. not going to last, right? You mm -hmm. might make it, if, if you feel whoppingly better when you make a change, then that might be just the same itself. But if you're really just motivating yourself out of fear, it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to mm -hmm. last. So having people kind of take some time and really look at it and like, you know, you, what, what is it that you want to, if you made a change, what is it that you're making a change for? You want to be around to play with your grandkids? Do you want to mm -hmm. travel? I had one gentleman and he was, he had his, his wife had some Alzheimer's and he's like, I need to be around to take care of her because I don't want her to land in the nursing home. So he mm -hmm. had to get healthy for that. So it's, it's individual for different people, but if you can, the nice thing in primary care is that you, you know people better and then you can, you get to know what it is that they, what they really care about. And you can use that as a, you know, a draw to get them in. Right, right. But it is yeah. really hard to switch from the type to, from for diabetes from the typical diabetic diet to a whole food plant based diet. It's just so opposite. It's really, mm -hmm. really tough. And if you only go yeah. part way, your sugars go up and people panic, right? Because if you still right. have fairly high fat, but you increase the carbs, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you run into trouble because you you get that you know they'll do it halfway. Their sugars are going to go up thirty points and they're going to freak out. They're going to go back to what they were doing. You'd be like, no, you got to. That's gotta exactly this. right. You gotta make, yeah. If you're doing that, make the switch quickly or just expect them to go up because until you get your fat at least under 20%, 10% is best, best but mm -hmm. if you can't, if you don't get it under 20%, you're still going to have the insulin resistance yeah. along with the extra carbs and it's going to be worse. Yeah. In the book, Mastering Diabetes, they do a really good job explaining all that. And, uh, you know, I, I try to explain to people that, yes, if you're on a higher fat diet, it's true. You're going to need more insulin, the more carbohydrates you take in. Um, but if you lower that saturated fat, your insulin can work properly and you'll be eating more carbs and need less insulin. And it's a complete mind bender for people. It is. Um, it's much easier I, to catch people when they're pre-diabetic and they haven't really tried to, they haven't been doing the American Diabetes Association diet for 10 years before you mm -hmm. get them. Switching mm -hmm. those people is really tough. Um, yeah. Yeah. I well, love I the Mastering remember... Diabetes program. That's, it's, it, it's, it's more heady than a lot of patients could get get their brains around, but, um, yeah. but I think it's fascinating. It is fascinating. And actually in that book, they document that there's experiments going back about a hundred years where they've shown mm -hmm. that people on high fat diets had worse diabetic control than people on, on, um, low fat diets, eating a lot of carbs. But, um, uh, I think, you know, one thing I think that you and I have to keep in mind when we talk to people is that we may not be successful when we first talk to them, convincing them, but we're at least planting a seed. I, I remember many years ago, probably, you know, 10 years before I went plant-based, I heard a video with Dr. McDougall talking about eating all these carbs and um, thinking, well, where are you getting your protein, you know? And uh, and then I even I even saw Forks Over Knives, uh, I think fairly shortly after it came out, and I was just incredulous. Um, I, you know, was always, I was big on weightlifting and, you know, in that whole world, you need a lot of protein and I just dismissed it. Um, uh, but then it, it planted a seed that eventually I kind of opened up my mind. And interestingly, just since late last summer, I've gone back to sort of a heavier emphasis weightlifting, which I had abandoned for a number of years. Um, you know, I've been working out, I was in good shape, but then I realized, you know, I've lost some strength. I kind of need to build my strength back up and, um, uh, I've been carefully working up into heavier weights and I've gained 17 pounds since last summer. And uh, eating entirely plant-based. So that kind of answers the question, well, obviously I'm getting enough protein. Um, you know, uh, and this concept is out there that you have to eat animal flesh to, to grow your own flesh. And I was a little bit spooked by that much weight gain. And just yesterday, I went for a body composition test um, because I was thinking, oh, I must be gaining fat. And um, I'm only three percent on the third percentile for body fat. Um, so, you know, I, I'm OK. And so yeah. um, I built all this okay. lean tissue. Yeah. Yeah. So I built all this lean tissue, no animal products at all. Um, and um, I actually, you know, I use chronometer once in a while. Are you familiar with chronometer? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll put in my uh, intake and I'll actually be a little below what they recommend on protein intake, but I'm still gaining muscle. So I, th I think that the recommendations on protein or my suspicion is the recommendations on protein intake when you're trying to build muscle are actually higher than they need to be. And if you talk to like the vegan bodybuilder pundits, they say 1.3 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. I think that's probably higher than it needs to be. Um, 
you know, the standard recommendation is 0.8 uh, mm-hmm. grams per kilogram, which most people b- get that easily. Yeah. Um, so anyways, what are your thoughts on protein intake and plant-based diets? So, so the biggest thing is making sure that you're getting enough calories. Cause if you're losing weight, you're going to lose muscle along with it. Even when you're working out, it's really, it's really hard not to. And if you think about it, you're not going to build muscle until you strain that muscle and you're not going to be able to contract those muscles if you don't have carbohydrates around to do it with. So basically you just need the package. You need both protein and you need enough carbohydrates so that you're, so you're powering up the muscle and then you got stuff to build more muscle. So you just need to make sure you're eating enough, enough plants. Um, I encourage people, um, if they're really worried about this, like that you're really not trying to lose weight during this phase, you're trying to move the fat into muscle. So, so instead of focusing on that weight loss, which is really hard to, to do without losing muscle along, along with it, that you really focus on kind of keeping that weight where you want it, build the muscle, and then you become a more lean machine anyway, uh, a, a more efficient machine, you're burning more calories, and it ends up drawing off some of the weight later. But if the primary focus is really on weight loss. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot for that. Just make sure you're getting enough calories. I read something somewhere that Serena Williams, the tennis player, when she was at her peak, she was, she was consuming over 6,000 calories a day. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you just have to eat a lot to power everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've been, when I track my calories, I'm eating about 4,000 calories a day, um, yeah. you know, plant-based and, um, and staying, you know, relatively lean. Um, when I was looking at your website, you know, something that caught my eye was that you have an interest in autoimmunity and, um, uh, you know, tell us about the relationship between diet and, and autoimmunity. So um, autoimmune disease uh, is a cluster of diseases where your immune system decides that you are foreign and then you start attacking yourself. The proteins that look most like us are animal proteins. So a lot of times it will be an animal food. Lots of times it's dairy, but it can be other animal-based foods. And it, it's not always food. So so there's that as well. But lots of times it'll be an animal-based food. That protein looks enough like us. We make an antibody against that. And then it turns around and starts. we start attacking ourselves. Um, unlike diabetes and heart disease, where a whole food plant-based diet almost always works. You, you almost always see really great results. Autoimmune disease is more hit and miss. Sometimes it's not the food that was the trigger. So if you take away the food uh, that you thought was the trigger, you don't see any response. And sometimes your body has just so hardwired now that you are the enemy that even when you take away the trigger, it keeps doing that. But I would say that about 60% of the time you can get patients with autoimmune disease remarkably better with going to a whole food plant-based diet. So I always talk to people like it is so worth trying and you need to give it, um, you're not going to see immediate results because the antibodies are still going to be circulating, right? Initially. Um, So you've got to wait a little bit of time for that. But if you can give three months of a whole food plant-based diet before you're kind of reassessing this. And if I have somebody who's not willing to give up everything, I'll ask them to give up just all dairy. Um, And lots of folks will get amazingly better just doing that. Um, And, you know, even if it doesn't work for their autoimmune disease, they're not likely to die of their autoimmune disease. They're still more likely to die of heart disease and cancer. And uh, so it still helps them overall. So, um, but you know, it's very motivating for a lot of people to, to, to do that. I especially like to do autoimmune gut stuff because it's tricky. So I feel like you're like super MacGyvering with that because most people who've got autoimmune gut disease, they can't, you can't just go automatically on the normal whole food plant-based diet. You got to cook everything or you got to blenderize everything and you're sneaking in small amounts at a time and doing different. Anyway, it's just, you're constantly MacGyvering to make it work for those folks. And so I really, I find them challenging. And I, so they're, they're fun. Yeah, I was, in fact, I was going to ask you about that. Um, j- just a few thoughts, you know, we had uh, Brooke Goldner on the podcast and it was interesting, you know, she's a big yeah. advocate of the green smoothies yeah, she'll do and, massive uh, lots of green smoothies where everybody drinks so much they gain weight while they're on them. <laughs> well, I we had a lot of kale in our garden last year, and so we were on a, on a green smoothie kick. And interestingly, I, you know, I'd had a bit of plaque psoriasis on my elbows like forever. You know, it didn't bother me in any way. Well, I started drinking all these green smoothies. It actually went away, mm-hmm. uh, which was astonishing. But um, here, here's a question for you. You know, we, we post these videos, and we frequently get – comments from carnivores about how, you know, what we're saying is just not true and carnivores the way to go. And these carnivore 
advocates on YouTube, I mean, they have these huge followings and you look at the comments and people seem to clearly be getting better when they're eliminating animal products and just eating meat. But if you're going on a meat only diet, you're also eliminating the 42% of calories that the average American gets from processed carbohydrates, right. which no, people completely overlook. So yeah. that by no means proves that meat is an optimal diet. And then, of course, if they're eating processed foods, there, I got my understanding is there's a lot of additives in processed foods that can interfere with uh, uh, gut permeability, you know, so-called leaky gut. And so that might be part of the mechanism of why they're getting better. Um, but these people, they definitely feel better. But uh, my response is generally in the short term, you feel better. But what you're doing is not necessarily optimal. Um, you're, so you're still pulling on all of these reserves that you have from when you're eating other things. Wait, plant foods, right? But you're going to mm -hmm. deplete those. There's a whole, mm -hmm. a, a meat centric diet, a, a, you know, almost an entirely meat diet is deficient in a heck of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and if yeah. you look at the longest living populations on the planet, none of them are eating a meat centric diet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting how even a relatively small amount of animal products will, uh, uh, make people heavier. You know, you look at the Adventist 2 study where mm -hmm. they're a fairly uniform population, you know, socioeconomically, they're all quite health conscious. And as you move from sort of omnivore to, um, uh, you know, semi-vegetarian to vegetarian, pescatarian, you know, vegetarian, et cetera, the less animal products they have, the leaner they are and the lower the rate of diabetes. <clears throat> and um, it doesn't seem to take that much animal products to boost your risk of diabetes. Um, which is, which is interesting, you know, um, that just a few servings a week of animal products can actually increase your risk for diabetes. Yeah. On the other um, hand, I think about, I think about, um, the health of any diet being what percentage of the calories are coming from whole plants. Because, yeah. uh, you know, if somebody's eating a hundred percent vegan, but it's all junk food, the outcomes are worse than eating the standard American diet. Right. So, right. it's, and if you, if you look at heart disease and cancer risk, it's really an inverse linear relationship. So the, the more whole plants that you eat, the less, uh, the less likely you are to die from cancer and heart disease. And, uh, so if you get somebody who's only eating 10% of the calories from whole plants and they go from 10 to 50% whole plants, mm -hmm. that's a huge improvement in their overall mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. Um, and so not everybody's willing to kind of go all the way. I think, you know, folks that are, have terrible in stage heart disease or, you know, like horrible autoimmune disease. A lot of those folks are, are willing to kind of jump all in because they're like, I got to do something now. Right. And they're really motivated, but the average person isn't. And, it, and it, particularly when you're doing kind of like a, you know, primary care audience, you're like, okay, where are you? How bad is it overall? And how can we, you know, if you swapped out this breakfast three times a week and you had minestrone soup instead of your ham sandwich for lunch, Wow, mm -hmm. you would you would quadruple the amount of whole plants you're getting in your diet. Mm -hmm. Why don't you mm -hmm. try that? You yeah, know? yeah. So you're in, in favor of sort of a stepwise progression in that direction. As a uh, you know, it depends on who you're working with, right? You got somebody mm -hmm. with with heart disease. I want them as whole food, plant based, low fat as I can get them as fast as possible. But I will take mm -hmm. whatever they can give me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you've got somebody who's got type two diabetes and they're trying to reverse it. You can't really go halfway without getting your sugars to spike, which is going to defeat them. So I would try to get them to go all in quickly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But for the average person that you're, then, you know, if I were seeing somebody, I'm not doing primary care anymore, but when I was seeing patients in my practice, I would do a baseline. I, I use the four leaf survey as a survey tool for estimating percentage of calories from whole plants. Nobody thinks that, that they're, you know, everybody does much worse than they think they're doing. Nobody mm -hmm. ever thinks that they're, they're, they're doing worse than they are. Um, so, um, and that, that kind of gives them an idea, you know, the healthiest people on the planet, the folks who live the longest, they're getting 80% or more of their calories from whole plants. The average American's getting somewhere around 10. We are right. so far from that. So look at a number and they'll kind of like say, okay, well, you are a little bit better than the average American. You know, most mm -hmm. people who think they're doing well are at about 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've even yeah. had people watch forks over knives and they'll come back in and they'll say, yeah, but I'm pretty much already eating that way. And then you actually go through what they're eating and they're getting 20% of the calories from whole plants. Right. So it's kind right. of like this reality check. And then you see, uh, you know, how much, some people will watch Forks Over Knives once and they'll be like, I'm all in. And they just flip mm -hmm. to it on a switch. And there are other people like, yeah, I definitely can't do that. And if you tell them they have to go all the way or, the, or forget about it, they'll do nothing. Mm -hmm. So, and it really, 
it really is that linear inverse linear relationship. So even if it's not perfect, it's better than not changing. So just do as yeah. much as you're kind of my mantra is do do eat as whole food plant based as you're willing and able without making yourself and the people you love nuts because nuts won't be right. sustainable. Right. It's just, not yeah. Gonna work. yeah. Yeah. I know. I think that that's good advice. I think one, one of the probably obstacles is, you know, the average person eats such a poor diet. Uh, as you said, like, you know, less than 10% of calories come from whole plant foods that if they, they double it, you know, which would be a, a relatively large change, they still think, I mean, and it's definitely better. It's still kind of a bad diet. Um, and, but the perspective is that the norm is so bad in the United States that people don't, can't really wrap their head around what a really good diet is. Yeah. That's why I really but, love that four leaf survey. I, I ran into it when I was working with patients and they come back in after watching forks over knives and they think they're doing well. So it's actually free. It's online. It's the number four leaf and uh, it's 12 questions. And so you can do it in about two minutes and I'll give you an estimate of your calories from whole plants. And then if you give them your email, it will send you a list of things that you can do to improve your diet. So, oh, okay. And you've got a book by that name too, don't you? Right. So, so I started using that survey in my practice because I needed something and it was the only thing that I could find. It was the only thing that was available then that was like a quick survey you could give patients that would estimate percentage of calories from whole plants. And mm -hmm. Jim Hicks was the one who originated it. In the book, he goes by J. Morris Hicks because there's some other famous Jim Hicks author and you didn't want to get confused with him. Oh. Um, and he gave me permission to use his survey with my practice patients. And he developed the survey, but nobody was using it. So he was all like all excited. Somebody was going to use it. And all he asked for was like for me to tell him, kind of give him some stories about how people are doing, let him know how it goes. And so I'd check in with him, you know, every once in a while. And I'd be telling him my latest great story about somebody getting healthier. And he got really excited and said, you know what, we should write a book. So he had actually, by the time I contacted him, he'd already moved off of eating this way in terms of personal health and had really recognized that if we don't get a whole lot of people on the planet eating more plants in a hurry, we're, we're, it's like the only thing that we can do quickly that's going to change our climate impact. Mm -hmm. So we could really move from the environmental to the environmental aspects of this. Um, so when we wrote the book together, I wrote the chapters that were on, on human health and he wrote the chapters that were on planetary health. And oh. this was, gosh, almost, it was nine years ago we wrote the book together. Um, and at the time there wasn't much that was out. The China study was out, but your average person isn't going to read the China study. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we wanted something that was kind of short. All the chapters were, you know, four pages or less. You can read the whole thing in two hours and basically just kind of like nuts and bolts. What the heck mm -hmm. are we talking about here? How do you get your head around this quickly instead of having like a million sources cited and having it be, um, more than the average person would read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting about the environmental aspect of it. I listened to a podcast um, with George Montbiot. He's an environmentalist. He's and, fabulous. Yeah. Um, he was talking about this concept of regenerative agriculture, this idea out there that, you know, cows grazing and, you know, pooping and regenerating the soil and so on is a net gain to the environment. But he said, um, if you were to like sort of have nothing but grass fed um, livestock in the United States, you would have to like knock down every building, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, tear out all the roads, every square inch of the continental United States would have to be dedicated and cut down every single tree. Every, every square inch of surface of the continental United States would have to be uh, dedicated to uh, grass fed um, agriculture uh, to meet the needs. And I, even still, you wouldn't meet the consumption needs of animal products in the United States. So that's that's kind of a canard that, you know, there is a, a benefit of uh, animal agriculture to the environment. But Just um, a caveat on that, it's not the, the needs, it's the desire or the, the, right. the current yeah. quantity that people want to eat, because honestly, we, none of us need to eat it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, actually, Joe, going back to your the GI thing, I'm I'm curious when you talk about sort of using the MacGyver skills to to deal with people's uh, gut intolerance issues. Like, what is your step if somebody's got inflammatory bowel disease? How, how do you inch them towards more plant based diet without causing them to be more upset? Because this is one thing that comes up in the internet all the time. All oh, plant based diets they make your gut upset, and you've got to avoid that. You know, eat nothing but meat for your gut to feel better. How, how do you get them more towards okay. that without causing upset? 
Well, so there are two pieces of this I wanted to address. The first one is that you grow the gut bacteria that you feed. So if you have just been eating a whole lot of meat, you're going to only have the gut bacteria that handle meat, and you're not going to have the ones that handle your vegetables or your fruits or your whole grains, right? So anytime you're making a change, it's going to take some time for your gut bacteria to adjust. The good news is you actually see a shift even after one meal, and you can see an entire flip-flop within two weeks. So there's a cool study that was out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I swear, I'm from north of Pittsburgh, and I did my medical training in Pittsburgh. Um, so this one always sticks in my head, but it took up um, folks who were in Africa who were eating a predominantly almost completely plant-based diet because that's all they had. They got colonoscopies and blood work and they um, for uh, biomarkers and also looked at the uh, gut bacteria. So it was looking at visual inflammation and with biopsies and the gut bacteria and blood markers for inflammation. And the folks who were in Africa, their stuff looks great took an equal group in uh, Pittsburgh, um, uh, Black Americans in Pittsburgh, and uh, had awful looking colonoscopies, terrible inflammatory markers, ugly gut bacteria, flipped their diets. And within two weeks, all the findings in their colonoscopy blood work and everything had switched. Switched them back, how they got people to sign up for three colonoscopies in one month, I have no idea, but switched them back. And then by the end, they were back to where they were originally. So you can completely transform your gut bacteria within two weeks. I'm sure all of them were gut miserable the entire month because it's like as soon as they got adjusted to what they were on and they were growing the right gut bacteria, they switched the diets on them. Um, so, you know, if you're making a change in this, if you're doing it uh, quickly for health reasons, just kind of know your gut's going to take a little time to, to catch up. Um, definitely do more of the cooked vegetables rather than the raw just because your gut's gonna not have to do as much work with those. And if you blenderize them, the blender's done a bunch of the work for you too, right? So um, so uh, when I'm working with somebody who's got autoimmune disease, inflamed gut, um, I will do the big green smoothies. I will ask people to do that, but I don't ask them to do that for every single meal like, like Brooke Goldler does. Um, I will tell them about Brooke's protocols and I'll give them the choice of doing that, but I'll say, I want you to drink one big one at least every day. And then trying to do cooked things that they already tolerate um, that are, uh, or other foods that they already tolerate. So most people tolerate sweet potatoes, even if they've got gut issues. So you might add more of that in, right? And then you try to kind of build up the quantity of, of what their foods are. And I, I really love soup because you can cut all those pieces into really you know, everything into really small pieces and really cook it well, giving the gut less to do. Um, and so that's usually my, my tactic with those folks. And a lot of them will tolerate fruits still. Uh, sometimes it'll be cooked, like it'll be applesauce or um, something, but even like roasted vegetables, I wouldn't do at that point. They have an inflamed gut. I want everything either pulverized or really uh, like in a blender or really soft cooked. Another thing that I'll often use is um, like a uh, butternut squash soup, mm. right? So it's again, completely blenderized, but most people will tolerate blood, butternut squash just fine, even if they have an inflamed gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the other things you have to be careful with, with some folks, if they've got, uh, especially if they've got Crohn's, is that they can have strictures in their gut. Oh, yeah. yeah. So those folks, you're probably never going to want them to eat a nice big raw salad. Mm. Right. You've got to be really careful about how much roughage you're trying to stick through it, depending on how big those strictures are. So I go really careful with those folks. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you ever use uh, any type of fasting um, with your with your patients? So water only fasting can be super helpful, but really you need to do it for more than one day. And it's not safe to do it for more than one day unless they're basically at a place like True North where you can monitor their blood and everything every day right that's the problem intermittent fasting i will use um i try not to use it i don't like it um for, for the a couple of reasons the first thing is that most people try to just do uh not eat in the morning and then they'll have their first meal you know just before noon and then they'll finish so their eight hour window is going to be squashed into kind of noon to eight which is kind of lousy for your metabolism anyway, right? We'd rather you eat your calories in the morning and skip at night, but people don't tend to want to do that. Um, it's not very comfortable. You're hungry then at night. And um, it's you know, when your reserve, emotional and psychological reserve is down. So um, then people will snack. The other thing that happens for a lot of my patients anyway, when they try to do this um, is that 
they'll they'll try to go till noon and not eat, but they're then the donuts show up at work or the bagels show up at work, whatever, and then they're there and they're hungry. Or they'll be so ravenous by the time they hit lunch, instead of eating that healthy lunch they packed, they order out or they go to Mickey D's, right? Um, I have a a mantra that I use is basically never to let yourself get more than a seven out of 10 on the hunger scale. So if 10 out of 10 is you eat cardboard because you're like ravenous, one out of 10 is you just ate Thanksgiving dinner. And if you have another bite, you might vomit. Seven is I'm hungry, but I'm not out of control yet. But you hit an eight. And basically your body is in that, oh my God, there's not enough food. I might starve to death. I better pack on the most calorie dense food I can find. I'm going to eat a lot of it. And you will eat really uh, calorie dense food. Like you're going to be liable to order that pizza, right? Instead of the healthy meal that even if it's right there, you're still going to order the pizza. Then you tend to eat twice as much of it as you normally would, but you'll snack the whole rest of the day. You'll just be like really hungry. And that's just your DNA talking. Our ancestors who did this survived long enough to procreate. So we're all here and that's kind of baked into our DNA that when we get really hungry, we're going to crave really calorie dense food and a lot of it. And it's going to be really hard to overcome that because it's a survival mechanism. So when you hit a seven, um, it's time to have a piece of fruit. I don't, I don't need to go from a seven to a three, but if it's seven and it's not a meal yet, it's a piece of fruit or it's a, I always have like couple of baked potatoes. I, I bake like five of them on the weekend. I can have them for snacks during the week. So um, if I've got some minestrone soup left over, I might have another small bowl of minestrone soup. It's just something to take that seven to a five or six, get you enough time to get to your next meal. Carrot yeah, sticks will I, not do that. Carrot sticks leave you at a seven. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of, the, I mean, there's, I, I know that there's these studies, you know, showing the, uh, potential longevity benefits with fasting, but in practical terms, um, and I have done it, you know, from time to time. Uh, but I remember one time I was so hungry, you know, I was just so hungry and I didn't have anything prepared. And I went, you know, to a burrito place and I got two great big burritos and I ate them so fast. Um, I think I, my esophagus was impacted. Um, and I was saying, if, if no, I didn't know better, you know, I, I probably would have gone to the emergency department. No, but I knew that there wasn't much that they would do. Um, so I just gave it an hour and eventually things went through, but that's how hungry I got. I mean, it was clearly kind of out of control. Um, so you have, there's that. Yeah. It's just like, you go, go nuts. I mean, you know, at least, were, at least they were healthy. Some, <laughs> there were some uh, studies that actually show a worse outcome from intermittent fasting. The ones that show the positive outcomes are ones where it's really like you're going for three or more days. Like you're doing like yeah. a chunk of time because it, it resets your system into basically um, scavenging for malfunctioning cells and you kind of do this clean out. Um, right. So it's an anti-aging kind of thing and it's actually super helpful, but you, you can't do a completely water only fast for that mm. long unless it's supervised. And, um, and really there's, there are very, very few places you can go to, to do a supervised water only fast. True North is yeah. the only one in person that I know of. I, apparently there's another one, but I don't know it. Um, I think Dr. Furman's got a facility. I think Dr. Furman's got a facility in San Diego as well. Okay. Yeah. California is a little bit more lenient on the um, regulations on these things. Everybody else kind of thinks they're quackery, but oh. honestly, the studies are good. When yeah. you look at the, uh, when you look at the studies, True North is doing more publishing more of what they're doing with their studies now, which is really helpful. Um, I, if you're, if you want to do intermittent fasting for the longevity benefits, I would think about doing Prolon. Um, that is a, a fasting mimicking diet, a five day fasting mimicking diet, um, mm. that is safe. And that is, um, uh, through Walter Longo, uh, he's mm-hmm. the longevity expert. Um, and that's a product is basically it's five days and it tricks your body into thinking you're fasting without you being completely fasting. So you don't get as hungry, although you still get hungry. Yeah. Um, and it's safe. Yeah. So, and there's one, you, they use another one for diabetes too. Um, El Nutra is a five day fasting mimicking diet that they'll use for diabetes and there's slightly different protocols. There's something like hmm. $34 million in research that went into developing these products. Oh, really? Um, so, wow. Yeah. So they're very well researched. Um, I don't know exactly all the ways they differ between the two of them, but. Do, do you um, think that fasting has a role like as a means of weight control? Um or is it mainly sort of the, for the apoptosis and autophagy and longevity benefits? 
Um, I think that it's more for the latter, uh, yeah. honestly, because most people, you'll lose weight while you're on it, uh, but you typically regain it very quickly afterwards when you go back to your other habits. Um, I would work on trying to keep the weight as consistent as possible mm -hmm. um, once it comes down, like so losing it gradually and then keeping it solid because that whole yo-yo dieting thing is not good for us, right? It just teaches your metabolism to ratchet down so that you don't starve to death. Right. You get yeah. very good at not starving to death by ratcheting your metabolism down. Yeah. So I don't like to see big swings in weight. I, I, I struggle when I when I see a patient on Love Life Telehealth and they've they've yo yo 10 times already. And they're like wondering why, you know, nothing's budging now. I'm like, well, your metabolism is like really <laughs> it's really sluggy now because it's just really trying to hold on to everything. And then you got to work really hard to overcome that. Much easier yeah. when somebody, we wanted you to lose it once and then this is maintainable. I can do this. It's a lifestyle change where it holds rather than a diet that you go on and then you're going to go off. Yeah. I think, I think if you're going to fast, the, the really, really you got to address those day-to-day -day habits um, that are going to, that's going to affect your body weight. And that's probably more important than fasting. Now, are there other aspects of lifestyle medicine that you address with your, uh, your patients? Oh, heck yes. So, like, you know, all the bang in our health, 80% of our health is made up by what we do with our fingers, our forks and our feet. Fingers is smoking alcohol and drug use, the toxins. Uh, forks is what we're, you know, putting on the end of our fork, what we're eating, and feet is our physical activity. And those three things together make up 80% of our health. But I really think of those as being like the first floor of your house, right? And you might want your first floor to look really great because that's what everybody's going to see. But sleep, stress, and love, which is good relationships and having positive motivators, they are the foundation on the house that you built, right? And I, I focus more on those three things. I always start with what, what are your positive motivators? Because about, oh, I don't know, maybe a quarter of the folks that come to see me, they're motivated because something bad happened and they are really motivated by fear. And if you get them to think about it, they can focus on what they want to be alive for, but they're really just focused on fear when they come in. And that's why you get somebody who has a heart attack and he's really great for two months, do, you know, eating well and getting exercise. And then by month three, they're back to doing all the things that give them a heart attack in the first place, right? It's not sustainable to motivate yourself long-term by fear because it feels crappy, right? You're either going to be so anxious or so depressed that life isn't worth living anyway, so might as well have the cheeseburger. Or you stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. You have to motivate yourself by what you love and want to be around for. So that comes first. And then, you know, if you're not having, if you're not sleeping well, well, how do we keep ourselves awake during the day? We eat sugar, we chomp on chips. Uh, you know, how likely are you if you're really exhausted to cook dinner versus just ordering a pizza, right? Like, so having really good sleep habits is really important. Certainly treating sleep apnea, if you've got it, is critical. Um, everybody says, you know, they have sleep apnea. They're like, I'm going to lose weight so I don't have to have a CPAP machine. Well, when you're having your airway chunked off a zillion times a night, your cortisol levels are through the roof. That makes you hold on to weight it's really hard to lose it. So unless somebody's got really mild sleep apnea, I'm like, just get the CPAP machine. We'll work on the weight. You can get rid of the CPAP machine later, but you're just shooting yourself in the foot if you don't treat that sleep apnea. Um, so I focus really hard on those. And then stress management. Seriously, if, if, if eating is your only stress management technique, then when you take that away, it's bad, right? Um, so you, you need to have a really strong way of... Uh, I think about it as stuff that you do all the time, whether you're stressed or not. It's kind of like just your maintenance stress management. And then the, the you know what, hit the fan stress management emergency plan and have lots of things in that kind of basket of tools really develop that well. And then you can take away, you know, if food was being used as a, a stress management tool, then, then if you pull it away, you're not going to substitute some other bad habit like alcohol. Um, and I think about it just like if you were working on your house, right? If Think about your kitchen as your diet. Let's say you built this gorgeous kitchen, right? But you built as you, either you built it on a lousy foundation to begin with, in which case, how long is it going to last? Or as you built that kitchen, your foundation was okay, but as you built that kitchen, you screwed up your foundation, right? Then the whole thing's not going to last either. So I think about the, the first floor of the house, the fingers, forks, and feet. Great, build that, but make sure it's on a solid foundation to start with. And as you're building it, you cannot do anything that screws up your foundation. So if you get, you know, if you're doing your physical activity, but in doing your physical activity, you're no longer spending time with your family that you need to spend time with. Or you're no longer sleeping because you're getting yourself up at 4 a.m. to go to, you know, boot camp, right? 
it's not going to work, right? So you can't make any moves on the stuff that really matters, the fingers, forks, and feet, if you're going to, if, if doing that screws up sleep, stress, or love. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of weird because I think about it very systematically when I'm working with people. I'm like, okay, this is the first thing I care about. This is the second thing I care about. And they're, they all think they're coming to me for the food. And I'm like, yeah, yeah we're going to come back to that. Because <laughs> yeah. it does really matter. It's the, it's the area where you get the most, the biggest bang. First of all, mm-hmm. because it has such a massive impact on our health. But secondly, because it's where we're the most far off, right? The healthiest mm-hmm. people, 80% or more that comes from whole plans, we're at 10. So mm-hmm. yeah, we're not great at exercising either, but you only really need 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. Mm-hmm. So most people are getting maybe half that. I mean, it's really kind of sad that we're doing as poorly as we are, but it's, it still doesn't have as much impact as the food because we're not as far away from what's going to get us. Yeah. Home. Yeah. The physical activity part, it's really only about 20 minutes a day. Um, and, uh, I looked at this a little bit re- fairly recently. I mean, there is further benefit beyond that, but, uh, you know, if you can't get 20 minutes a day and to go for a walk or whatever, there's something really wrong about your priorities or how your life is structured. But the, the sleep aspect has become very interesting to me lately because I was just recently diagnosed with sleep apnea. And, uh, we're going to do some videos on this because it's been quite a journey for me because, uh, you know, for 20 years, I've kind of thought there was, there was definitely something wrong. And I look back even further. I've had something wrong with my sleep for a long time. I saw three sleep doctors over the course of about the last 15 years or so. And I said, you know, there's something wrong with my sleep. I get this inappropriate afternoon sleepiness. I think I might have sleep apnea. And the three of them said, they, they basically said, no, I really don't think you've got sleep apnea. You know, you're not overweight. Um, they just kind of dismissed and thought a sleep study was not worthwhile. Well, we recently moved to rural Iowa, which is a whole story in itself. But uh, so I started with a new dentist and he observed that I've got some wear on my teeth. He says, oh, that's, you know, you've got wear on your teeth. That could be a sign of sleep apnea. And I perked right up and said, what? So I got a sleep study through the dental office and I do have mild sleep apnea. But then you know, for many, many years, uh, you know, I was taking call, working six, seven days a week, you know, often up in the middle of the night, super pull sleep apnea on that, you know, I'd get this horrible after nights, afternoon sleepiness. The last guy I said, saw said, you, I don't think you have sleep apnea, narcolepsy. I think you just have worked yourself into this huge sleep deficit from your work. And he says, it's going to take you two years to recover your sleep deficit. And I was shocked by that. And the two years went by where I ended up finished my obligation with the group I was with doing night call. And when two years went by and it definitely felt better, but still not a hundred percent by any means. And so, um, so, you know, through serendipity with the new dentist, uh, I've got this diagnosis and just recently started with a, a mandibular advancement device. It's like a retainer. Mm-hmm. And we're incrementally moving the lower part forward. So it, you know, prevents your tongue from going back, just making very small incremental changes. And I'm already noticing a huge difference. Like last night, I made another change where um, I strengthened the elastics holding the teeth together. See, it's important you keep your teeth, your mouth closed when you sleep, because otherwise the tongue tends to move back. And uh, I feel really good today. Um, And... um, uh, anyways, it's a, you know an incremental thing where you make these changes, but um, uh, so I've been reading up a lot on sleep apnea, and apparently eighty percent of people that have it never get diagnosed. It's um, so easy to test now. There's a home you don't have yeah. to go in and sleep overnight at the hospital anymore like you used to, yeah. right? It just set you up for a home sleep study. Now there are certain sleep problems that they have to still bring you into the hospital for that you mm-hmm. can't do in a home sleep study. But sleep apnea, they can diagnose that on a home sleep study, so you just take it home do it. They read it. You'll know. And again, right. So there are other techniques besides uh, the CPAP machine. So there's oral appliances. Um, You have to fail everything else to, to be eligible for the inspire, but, um, but you do have that as an option. So um, anyways, it's, 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 if there's any question that you, anybody might have it, I would encourage you to get checked. I'm sorry. You had three docs who said, no, I think that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's the last, the take home message is that if there's any suspicion at all, get tested. Um, If anybody out there has atrial fibrillation and hasn't been tested for sleep apnea, please get tested. Even mm -hmm. so we can see that even in folks who are really thin. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been really surprised by super thin folks have AFib and they've got sleep apnea and they don't even snore. 
but they had something mm-hmm. against the Gavion. It's a big trigger for, for AFib. And it gets yeah. the time. There's even a school of thought out there that uh, kids with um, uh, ADHD, that they, there's a, like, I'm not saying it's crack, but there's a school of thought out there that they all have disordered sleep breathing. And that that's a problem. Um, and uh, it gets into the really interesting field of study where, you know, we, our mandibles are not as developed as they used to be when we used to eat this hard, you know, roots and tubers and stuff like that. And our jaw development is not what it should be. Our teeth don't come in properly. We don't have enough room for our tongue. Um, it's a really interesting field of study. But um, anyway, it's just something else to think about if your child happens to have ADHD, something else to consider. Now, um, I, tell us about some of your success stories. Are there any study uh, cases that really stick out in your mind where people have turned their health around by making lifestyle changes? Yeah, um, I have two cases that that kind of like are like my most dramatic cases. One woman, she's type two diabetic. Um, she had been insulin dependent for more than ten years, and she was bad enough that she had an insulin pump, and she was on over three hundred units of insulin a day. Um, you know, she was fairly young. She's a few years younger than well, I guess she's right around anyway mid fifties. Um, and, uh, and I, I really did not think like, I, I really thought that her pancreas was probably shot, you know, she's on 300 units and I'm like, it's been, you know, 30 years of diabetes. And I really didn't think she would have a big, I, I knew she could get on less insulin because even in type one diabetics, they get about a 40% reduction doing a whole food plant-based diet, the low fat version of that. Um, so I know she'd have some reduction, um, but I, I, she wanted to get off all of her diabetic medication, which at that point was just insulin because she wasn't anything else. Um, and I was like, yeah, we'll see, but I um, wasn't really very helpful. And she, uh, she doesn't have completely normal um, hemoglobin A1C. That's the three month sugar check for those of you who don't, don't know um, the sugar average. Um, but it was in the completely controlled range. She was uh, between 5.6 and six on nothing nothing. Yeah. I mean, she was also exercising more than an hour a day. Um, but she just had this massive turnaround and she went from basically, uh, giving up on, on living. She was pretty much suicidal and had kind of given up, um, to, to really having her whole life back. So, um, so that's basically for me, that's a, you never, never give up and you never kind of make an assumption. I also had a, this wasn't the other patient story I was going to tell you, but I had a woman who had rheumatoid arthritis for over 30 years and she had tried every biologic on the planet and hadn't gotten a good response to anything. And she was on chronic prednisone. She went whole food plant-based and she had miraculous results. And it was 30 years. I thought that her autoimmune would be so set at that point that fixing her diet wouldn't have made a difference. And um, she was just so incredibly thrilled. I, you know, after all of those, I mean, she, obviously she was upset that she didn't find out about this 30 years ago, but, um, but she really had a whole new life. Um, she's got, you know, the structural damage from the, from the joint changes that had happened from before, but her inflammation is completely gone. She was having no, no, and she wasn't really having a lot of pain from the deformity, which was great. The story, the other patient story I was going to tell you was a, a gentleman that came to me as a consult and, um, he had, he had poorly controlled diabetes as well, but he had uh, end stage heart failure. And um, he, when he came to me, the first time I saw him, he says, well, they sent me home from the hospital to die. And um, he was on, I don't even know, 30 meds. He was on a ton of stuff and it was just a mess. But he, he went on a whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet. Um, and before he had gone on that diet, he, he couldn't, he had to, he basically lived, slept. Everything was in one room with the bathroom right next to it because he, he got so short of breath, he'd been going 10 feet. So he had one room that was his living room, but he would sleep in that room. He had to sleep sitting up because of his heart failure. And then he had the bathroom right next to it. And that was almost more than he could manage. Um, but he went on a whole food plant-based diet and, um, he is now working out for two hours or more to clip three days a week at his YMCA. He's off two thirds of his meds, his heart, his heart failure. He actually was bad enough that he could have gotten a transplant before, but he, he was too sick to be eligible for a transplant. But now he's not even his, it's not back to normal, but he's like at 35 to 40% for ejection fraction, which is enough to have a very functional life. But he's loving his new life as the celebrity as YMCA because, you know, everybody's like, he's on fire, right? He's just on fire. And just his whole joy for, for life is back. So 
Um, sometimes when you take somebody who's, you know, when they're really desperate and you do all at once, you just, he, they get better so fast that it becomes sustainable. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Yeah. When I hear stories like that, I just know that, you know, this is the right way to go. Um, and it's hard to convey to people the, the massive changes that they may experience when they make these changes. But you don't uh, see results like this with any pill you give anybody, right? No. Okay. If you've got strep throat, you give a penicillin. All right. You get a miraculous results. Yeah. You've got strep yeah. throat. Don't eat broccoli. Just go get your penicillin. But right. um, there's, a, there's a place for modern medicine. But the other thing is that people don't just have one chronic lifestyle related disease. Usually. Yeah. They usually have five or six because they all are caused by the same thing. Mm -hmm. When you fix what was causing one of them, you fix what's causing all of them. So they all get better at the same time. Now, that's not, all right, it's not always all, but most of them improve uh, at the same time. So you get a lot of bang from the changes that you make because it affects everything. Yeah, yeah, it's astonishing. Are there any supplements that you recommend to people? That, well, that B12. Adopt? B12. <laughs> B12, B12, B12. Uh, if you're doing a completely plant-based diet, you do not want to get deficient in B12 and it does not naturally come in a plant-based diet unless you eat dirty stuff and that's just gross. Right? Yeah. So you don't want the pesticides, you don't want to have parasites, mm -hmm. dirt tastes bad, wash your vegetables and just take a B12 supplement. Um, it's only in animal products because the animals ate dirty stuff, right? So B12 right. is made by microbes in our dirt, right? So if you eat dirty stuff, you get B12. I know that sounds kind of gross, but... Um, we were designed to eat things that weren't so clean. So, um, so B12, any, certainly. Any thoughts on omega-3s? Um, should that be a standard part of a person's uh, supplement regimen? So debatable, right? So I always mm -hmm. make sure that I get a really good source of omega-3s in my diet every day. I usually will do walnuts, but it might be chia seeds. It might be flax seeds. It's usually walnuts. Just mm -hmm. I kind of like mm -hmm. this better. Um, you know that we we think about omega threes. Omega threes are really important. Your body can't make them, so you have to get them from an outside outside source. But um, we you need both omega threes, which are anti inflammatory, and omega sixes, which are pro inflammatory. And you want a ratio between the two, somewhere between one to one to one to three. You don't want to have three times more of the pro inflammatory than the anti inflammatory, but you can go up to one to 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 three. In Almost every plant-based diet you can concoct, you're going to fall somewhere between 1.1 to 1.3. Um, but just to be on the safe side, I just make sure I get a little extra. I get a good source of omega-3s in every day. There's some data that shows that for folks as we are aging in particular, over 50s, that we might want to take a little bit of it into a supplement. Um, mm -hmm. The only data really that has shown improvement are folks that already have mild cognitive, uh, mild cognitive loss. Those folks do better if you supplement them. For folks who are normal trying to prevent early cognitive loss, that study is not out yet. Mm -hmm. So um, theoretically, we might, but I just cannot say right now that it that it's worth taking. Mm -hmm. The one thing that is definitely worth taking, depending on where you live in the United States, is uh, vitamin D. Um, right. Vitamin D is the molecule that carries calcium from your gut into your bloodstream. And mm -hmm. I live in upstate New York, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. from Ireland, so I wear sunscreen. So if I'm going outside anytime in the summer, I'm sunscreening and that's going to block most of your vitamin D. We just don't yeah. get enough of it. We make vitamin D in our skin on exposure to sunlight only when it's strong enough to actually cause some color in your skin. And so that how much of the time are we getting any kind of strong enough light? We're getting color on our skin in, you know, a nice big portion of the U S if you live in right. Florida, you live in the South, you're probably fine. Depending on how yeah, much you're it's probably worthwhile. <coughs> Excuse me. It's probably worthwhile to get checked once in a while. I had mine checked fairly recently and I was taking 2000 international units a day, which I thought was enough, but it was just a little bit, still a little on the low side. So I, you know, bumped the, the amount up and, you know, um, uh, it's, you know, been, been winter time and you just don't get out as much. So it's not a bad idea. 2000 um, is usually enough. Most people will be in the pocket with that. Were you in the low thirties and you just wanted to be a little yeah. higher? Yeah. yeah. Well, my, my guess would be that you're being a normal range, but you weren't kind of like optimal range with that one. Um, right. But, yeah. but you're right. You want to check levels first of all, because you might not be getting enough. And secondly, you don't want to take too much mm -hmm. because it can be toxic. Right. So, and the same thing for B12 levels. Um, we, we don't want to go too low because if you go low, you can have permanent neurologic damage. And by the time your toes are tingling, it might not be reversible. So don't go mm -hmm. there. 
We used to think that if you took too much, you just pee it out because it is a water soluble vitamin, unlike vitamin D, which is stored in fat, which is why checking your levels there is really key. But, um, but the B12 at high levels can give you actually similar weird neurologic symptoms as having low levels. It is reversible, but it's not completely as benign uh, to overdose on B12 as we used to think. So oh, sorry, I check a I, level and see. I was um, not aware of that. I was, yeah, not aware of that. I, I was yeah. not aware that it was an issue either until a patient of mine had a, had some symptoms and we did a test thinking it was really going to be low and it was sky high. And then she did some research and showed me the stuff from, it was either the Mayo or the Cleveland Clinic talking about stuff at the high levels. I was like, okay, well, they're reputable. How did I miss this? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I liked people taking it daily rather than weekly because it's just a little bit easier to kind of, uh, you don't absorb very much at one time usually. So it's just kind of mm -hmm. easier to help your body absorb it and then check a level at least once a year. If you adjust a dose, you want to check it again three months later and see mm -hmm. where you are. Mm -hmm. to keep that. And in interestingly, nice uh, you can get enough for two people, um, a year supply for two people for about $15, you know, uh, That's if sweet. that, um, it's not expensive at all. Mm -hmm. Um, now this has been really wonderful and I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, where can people get a hold of you? Well, uh, they can certainly go to my website, uh, which is okay. www.carrygraph, K-E-R-R-Y-G-R-A-F-F-M-D.com. Um, but I also, I, and there's a bunch of things kind of through there and it will link you to where I see patients on telehealth. Um, but I work through love.life telehealth. That's John Mackey's new thing. So John Mackey's mm -hmm. the, the founder for Whole Foods. Uh, he sold that to Amazon a number of years ago and he started up uh, love.life, which is a lifestyle medicine um, company. It, it's forming practices, but there's none in my area. The first one's starting in, in California in a couple of months. But as part of that, he has got a whole national network of lifestyle medicine docs who do telehealth. And we can see patients in all 50 states. I only see patients in New York, but there are um, docs who can see you in any state. And it's a wonderful team. I am, I'm so blessed. I have the best colleagues there. They're all great. I would recommend any of them, all of them. So yeah, we, whatever state we, you're in, use them. We've, went, we've met a few of them. And um, yeah. uh, we've actually had uh, Anthony Masiello on the podcast. So, you know, these people are really motivated to promote, you know, the whole food plant-based diet, nutritional and uh, lifestyle medicine. So I think it's a great organization. We're really pleased with that. We'll post uh, links um, to uh, love.life and also your website. I encourage people to check both of those things out. So um, again, well, thanks. You for my, oh, you're welcome. If you go to my website, you can click on a download, a free copy of the four leaf guide to vibrant health, which is what I had uh, the book that I co-wrote, but you can get it for free electronically if you go to the site and you just click on the button. Okay. Well, we, we will uh, encourage people to do that. And, you know, thanks very much. And hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Pleasure okay, to meet you. Okay. Have a good day.